Welcome, willing workers, to our lesson for Sunday, November 27th. This will be the last uh, Sunday of the quarter for us. This will be the last uh, lesson coming from the book of Micah uh, that we will have. And we begin a new quarter, and we will be taking the entire quarter to study the book of John. And we will look at the first 11 chapters of John, which uh, do not include the uh, last chapters, which deal with Jesus' last week uh, before his crucifixion. We will be looking in John at Jesus' coming and uh, his uh, teachings and his theology up through chapter 11 in the coming weeks. We will take time at Christmas to look at the Christmas story from the book of Luke. And uh, those days are holidays on Sunday. The Christmas day falls on Sunday. New Year's day falls on Sunday also. I uh, do not know for sure, but uh, most likely there will be no Sunday school class on either of those days. Therefore, the only lesson you will get will be what I record for those dates. I hope that your Thanksgiving was blessed and that you had family as well as friends uh, who to join you in being thankful and eating a feast. Our family certainly did, and we are grateful to God for all that he does for us. Let's go to our last lesson for the quarter uh, from the book of Micah. The title of our lesson today is Hope Found, and we're going to look at two, uh, at two sections of Micah, chapter 7. We'll be looking at verses 1 to 10, and then we'll jump up to verse 18 through 20 to conclude our lesson. As I go through our lesson today, let's remember the theme of this lesson is Hope is found in God's promised salvation to those who trust him. All right, let's go to the scripture here and see what uh, Micah had to say under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. Micah opens this with, woe is me. We understand this phrase uh, coming from uh, his lips with all the prophecies that he has made uh, about both kingdoms, primarily the kingdom of Judah, but he included Israel as well. Uh, I'll have more to say about that. Woe is me, says Micah, for I have become as when the summer fruit has been gathered as when the grapes have been gleaned. There is no cluster to eat, no first ripe fig that my soul desires. The godly has perished uh, from the earth, and there is no one upright among mankind. They all lie in wait for blood and each hunts the other with a net. Their hands are on what is evil to do it well. The prince and the judges ask for a bribe, and the great man utters the evil desire of his soul. Thus, they weave it together. The best of them is like a briar, the most upright of them is a thorn hedge. The day of your watchmen, your guards that is, of your punishment has come. Now their confusion is at hand. Put no trust in a neighbor. Have no confidence in a friend. Guard the doors of your mouth from her who lies in your arms. For the son treats the father 
with contempt. The daughter rises up against her mother. The daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own house. But as for me, Micah, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Rejoice not over me, O my enemy. When I fall, I shall rise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him until he pleads my cause and executes judgment for me. He will bring me out to the light. I shall look upon his vindication. Then my enemy will see and shame will cover my enemy who said to me, where is the Lord your God? My eyes will look upon my enemy. Now she will be trampled down like the mire of the streets. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance? He does not retain his anger forever because he, God, delights in steadfast love. God will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all your sins into the depths of the sea. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. You, O oh God, will show faithfulness to Jacob steadfast love to Abraham as you have sworn to our fathers from the days of old. Most of us uh, uh, don't like to wait, whether it be a line at the grocery store, the retail store of some kind, or in traffic. Uh, we all <laughs> have been raised not to wait. We are instantaneous Americans. Uh, whatever it is, we want it and we want it now. That's kind of the way we uh, we became, oh, I don't know, probably after World War II and uh, the great wealth of people began to accumulate and uh, this part of our uh, ego and, and psyche was to not wait for anything. But Micah wrote to Judah primarily that had waited for many, many years for the coming of Messiah. They had heard from the prophets of the coming of Messiah. And this Messiah would right all of the wrongs of the world. This Messiah would bring salvation to the people of God at that time, they thought they, the Israelites, were the only people of God. Well, they needed to realize that hope was found in God's promise alone. And God's promise of salvation to those, those Israelites and uh, Gentiles who put their trust in him. They needed to hold on to faith and live in anticipation of the day God would deliver them. Now, let's go to our verses and dig a little bit deeper into them. In verses 1 to 4, Micah began uh, this section of his book, Woe is me. Now, we have seen and have are aware of this phrase being used also in the book of Job, uh, Job chapter 10, and in the book of Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 6, when he saw the glory of God in the temple. Uh, this phrase, woe is me, is an explanation. Explan 
exclamation, I'll get it right in a minute, of despair and hopelessness. Micah was describing his own feelings of alienation, isolation, and discouragement as he witnessed the depravity of the Israelites, both in Judah and in Israel, the northern and southern kingdoms. Now, under Jewish law, once a farmer uh, had harvested his crop, the laws that God had given to Moses uh, forbade the farmer from going back over his fields, his orchards, his vineyards to get anything that he might have missed. Instead, that that he missed was to be left for poor people and for foreigners who had no land of their own. We read about that in Leviticus chapter 19 and Deuteronomy chapter 24. We also have a very good example of this in the book of Ruth, when Ruth went out to the fields of Boaz to glean uh, grain from the field after the reapers had gone through. Micah himself was a spiritually hungry man. He wanted to glean and discover before it was too late. He wanted to try to find some cluster of something to eat. And he looked among the people and he saw nothing but depravity. And therefore there was nothing to glean. There was nothing of a cluster for him spiritually to eat. Micah was describing here the opposite of what God had actually promised Israel if Israel had remained faithful. The, we find that in Leviticus chapter 26 verse 5 where it says, Your threshing shall last to the time of the grape harvest, and the grape harvest shall last to the time for sowing, and you shall eat your bread to the full and dwell in your land securely. The only problem was neither Jews nor Israel had been faithful to God, and their depravity was on display. In verse 2, Micah explained that the people of Israel and Judah had become spiritually barren. The godly, loyal, righteous person had vanished from both countries. There was none no one left in the land. Isaiah described the situation in Israel similarly in Isaiah chapter 5 verse 7. Micah was describing these people as those who hunted down their fellow countrymen like animals lying in wait with a net to capture their prey. These people were thoroughly accomplished and thoroughly efficient when it came to doing evil. Jeremiah described Judah very similarly in Isaiah chapter 4 verse 22. He described Judah as wise in doing evil. These accomplished evildoers uh, were the people who were the civil leaders, the judicial leaders of their countries. And the rich and the powerful people in those countries were dictating what these uh, political and judicial leaders should rule as. Uh, it resulted in a systemic exploitation of their fellow countrymen, those who were uh, lesser in economic status than those who were paying the political leaders and the judicial leaders. He called, Micah called the best of these people a briar, 
Can you imagine being described the best way that you could be described as a briar? Or the most upright of the people were described as a thorn hedge. Now, I don't know really what a thorn hedge looks like. I know what a hedge of bushes look like. And I cannot imagine a hedge with nothing but thorns on it. Uh, that has to be very deadly. Everybody in both Israel and Judah were out for themselves. No one could be trusted by another. In verse 4, though, we also switch to the judgment that these people were about to experience. Even though Israel had ignored the prophetic messages that God had sent through his messengers for centuries. God once again here was being gracious with his message sent through uh, Micah. Though it was a warning of coming judgment, God was still giving them time to turn from their evil ways and to return to God. Uh, the armies that were gathering at the borders to invade the land, uh, they would be God's instruments of judgment. We know that Assyria was that instrument in the northern kingdom and that Babylon was the instrument in the southern kingdom. Uh, God's instruments of judgment were at the door and it was time in this case, for Israel, the northern kingdom, to panic. Verses 5 and 6 here, we have Micah indicated that nobody can rely on a neighbor, a friend, or even your spouse. The most intimate of relationships had now become bereft of loyalty and fidelity. This was such a social disaster of the people of both countries. In verse 6, an upheaval that pervaded the families throughout the land uh, was described here. Micah said that sons showed contempt for their fathers. Daughters rose up in opposition against their mothers. Daughters-in-law opposed their mothers-in-law. I want you to understand that this uh, in the Old Testament is reiterated by Christ in the New Testament in his description of the last days uh, before his return. Here in the northern and the southern kingdoms, these people were in direct disobedience to the fifth commandment God had given them. I think most of us know what that commandment is, but here, here we go. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Exodus 20, verse 12. It's also repeated in Deuteronomy 5, verse 16. Disobedience to this commandment was one of the reasons that God was sending judgment upon both lands. Verses 7 to 10, Micah declared he would look to the Lord and wait for God for his salvation. Micah was confident the Lord would keep his covenant with those who still loved him and were faithful to keep his covenant. Looking and waiting uh, were descriptive of God and his salvation. And it meant that in the most desperate of situations, we not only believe that the Lord is the only one who can deliver us, we also believe he will deliver us. You catch that difference. We, we believe today that in desperate situations, God through Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, will deliver us. And that will now becomes a realistic 
will deliver us. We believe, we have faith that that will happen. And we now know he will do what he promises. Waiting for God means to trust in God's wisdom. Uh, all too often, we want to run out on our own and uh, do our own thing with our own wisdom. But God knows so much more than we do, and he is so much wiser. And if we could only learn to put our faith in his wisdom and let his will be done, we know we would come out much better. Believers have the assurance that God hears their prayers all the time. <coughs> We have that confidence in the Psalms, in Psalm 4, Psalm 6, Psalm 34. We have it in the New Testament in John chapter 9, 1 Peter chapter 3, and 1 John chapter 5. In verse 8, God would use Israel's enemies as an instrument of judgment upon the people of Israel, the northern kingdom. But... These enemies should be careful not to rejoice in their victory over God's people. Michael de Micah declared, according to God's promise, God would use this judgment to bring his people back to him. God is meaning good here uh, in judging his people and bringing judgment upon them by uh, their enemies. When Israel's enemies would see God restore his people, the enemies would be humiliated and realize that all of their efforts to destroy the people of God had come to nothing. Now you have to remember in that time, in that part of the world, when nations clashed and one came out the victor over the other, it was believed that they that that nation had also uh, been victorious over the other nation's God. We actually read about that in Obadiah chapter 15. But uh, the people of God here would look on in triumph as they witness God defeating their enemies. And of course, we see that in history happening, happening both to Assyria and to Babylon when the Medes and the Persians became an immense empire in the Middle East. Verses 18 to 20, Micah concluded his book by reminding the people of how wonderful God is and of the hope they could have because of his faithful love for them. The Lord does not hold on to his anger forever. What delights God is demonstrating his unfailing love to his children. Micah said that God cares for the weak. God never neglects those to whom he has committed himself. God would demonstrate his loving care for his children by forgiving their sins and putting them as far behind him as the east is from the west. This was ultimately accomplished through the person and work of Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus the Messiah, Jesus our Savior and Lord. Micah's final statement the words of faithfulness and steadfast love pertain to the Lord's loyalty and his faithful love to his covenant people at that time, and that would have been the Israelites. Jacob and Abraham had covenants made with God. God promised he would bless them, bless their descendants, make their descendants as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. 
Those covenants are given to us back in Genesis chapter 22. God also promised that in you, Abraham and Jacob, and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. That's you and I, folks. And we have certainly been blessed by our Messiah, our Savior, and Lord Jesus. And we read of this blessing in Genesis chapter 28. All believers, you and I, as well as those Israelites who believe in Jesus as the Messiah, are included in these promises. Paul writes about it in Romans 4, Galatians 3. And I believe Paul to be the author of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 11. What a way for Micah to conclude his message in a glorious manner. Every believer today can count on God's eternal faithfulness and steadfast love. I pray that you believe that. Uh, this day that you have believed it your entire life, and if not, you begin to believe that from this day forward. <clears throat> Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we see your judgment upon the people you had chosen, the Israelites, thousands of years ago. But, Father, we also read in the Old Testament and even more in the New Testament of your great love, of your grace, your mercy on all those who believe in your Son, Jesus, and his works on his earthly ministry and his resurrection from an atoning death on the cross. Oh God, as we enter this Advent season, may we see clearly the plan of salvation that you have brought upon this earth and how it is working itself out even today as we look toward the signs that, that uh, make for the coming again of our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name I pray. Amen.